When carbon dioxide is mechanically captured from the atmosphere, either through direct air capture or through biomass pyrolysis or gasification with carbon capture, that captured CO2 needs to be stored in a place from which it cannot re-enter the atmosphere. And the safest, most secure place for us to put it is deep underground. But how do we know that underground storage is safe and secure? How do we know where underground we should put the CO2? And how do we get the CO2 from the facilities where it is captured to the regions where the best storage options exist? These are the questions that Dr. Sue Havorka and Peter Pisaris, with their teams of collaborators sought to answer in the recent Roads to Removal report. On this project, I worked on what to do with the very large amount of CO2 that will be captured. What we do with it is put it deep underground in geologic environments where it will be isolated from the atmosphere. The CO2 came from deep underground, so to put it back is a very uh, reasonable thing to do. I have a t-shirt that says, if you get CO2 out of the ground, put it back. The biggest takeaway from our work for this project is that we have plenty of space in the U.S. to take the CO2 from the atmosphere and put it away forever. Dr. Havorka and her team found that more than half of the United States land area is suitable for geologic storage. But what does suitable really mean? Well, we've known for decades that the same kinds of rock formations that are good traps for liquids, like the water in aquifers or the geologic formations that are rich in oil and gas, would also be good traps for CO2. These are rocks that are made from sediment, like sand or gravel or silt, that have lots of pore space between the grains. We store CO2 underground in very small spaces between the sand grains. This seems odd to many people who think if you want to store a lot of CO2, you need to look for big spaces like caves. However, that's not ideal because caves are protected and there are not enough of them. And also CO2 could come out of caves quite quickly. Most people have had some experience with fluids going into spaces between grains. Imagine yourself on a beach, it's made of sand, and you spill your drink. It goes right into the sand grains. There's no way to get it back out. You could try to get it out with your towel, but that drink is gone. So when CO2 goes into the spaces between sand grains, it's stuck permanently. That's why we like it. We also want them to lie in the Goldilocks depth. We want them to be not too shallow and not too deep. So they have to be deep enough so that they're below and isolated from fresh water. And they have to be shallow enough so that you're still keeping those spaces between the rock grains and they're not getting squished. That's usually depths greater than half a mile and less than three miles in the middle, about one or two miles deep is the ideal location. Luckily, there are many places in the United States that have geologic layers in the storage window with the potential to be good reservoirs for permanent CO2 storage. The United States is very wealthy in storage resources. It's not true for every country on Earth, but the United States is wealthy. We have a number of areas that we know very well that can accept very large amounts of CO2 right now. And in this report, we identified a lot of other areas that are attractive areas for exploration for storage resource. These regions must be studied further because even though it might be a bit more expensive to store CO2 there, it increases the chance that you can site the storage close to where the CO2 is being captured, which reduces the cost and complexity of having to transport the CO2, which is another important consideration for permanent underground CO2 storage. For the roads to removal report, we studied the transport of carbon dioxide and biomass. Transport is even in the discussion because storage isn't everywhere. Fortunately, because of that and the geographic constraint of storage, we may need to move CO2. We may need to move biomass to hit our scaling targets. Obviously, we're going to strive to co-locate these capture technologies, these removal technologies with viable storage basins, but it's not always possible and transport is the answer. We think people ought to know that the transport of CO2 is much more than just pipeline. There's a lot more nuance involved. The U.S. uses rail and trucking, and we see a lot of barge transport gaining momentum overseas. And so I think you take a look at all of these and explore how they could be expanded upon the success and the learnings that we've had demonstrated in these modes uh, to, to fit this large uh, bill of carbon management that we face. And when we are considering how we want to transport CO2, there are more considerations than cost. Pipeline networks take a long time to build because it has to be done safely and responsibly. 
And even though CO2 pipelines have a much lower incidence of failure or accident than oil and gas pipelines, of which we have more than 2.6 million miles in the United States, the perception of risk by communities potentially hosting CO2 pipelines that has come from inequitable practices in planning pipeline routes might mean that using alternative modes of transportation, like trains or fossil-free trucking, or perhaps a combination of approaches, would be the best way to ensure the equitable distribution of CO2 transport routes and that we're not further burdening already disadvantaged communities. I mean, historically, transport has almost been forced because we've been focusing on point source capture and those aren't movable and the storage basins are movable. What's beautiful about CDR is we have liberty of where to site these. So the best transport option we found is none at all. Co-locate these with storage basins so we can take transport out of the picture, take those risks and costs out of the picture. And we think communities would be very supportive of that. To learn more about the diverse approaches available for carbon removal in the United States, or to download the Roads to Removal report, visit roadstoremoval.org.